in Hawaii, invasive species are generally a very big problem because the ecosystems on oceanic islands like this are comparatively simple and thus they end up being open for new invaders. My colleagues and I have a National Science Foundation grant to study the effects of multiple species invasions. And here in this setting, we have uh, two main invasive species processes going on. One is the invasion of a tree called Albizia. We have in back of me, Albizia dominated forest. Albizia trees have been steadily moving in and taking over and replacing the Ohia dominated forest. And now what you have over there is a new forest type dominated by uh, Albizia. And layered onto that, we have the Koki frog invasion. We have Koki frog populations in here that reach spectacular densities, 20, 30, 40,000 frogs per hectare. And so we're looking at the effects of these processes on, on the ecosystem functions here in this forest. Only recently are amphibians recognized as an invasive species anywhere. The Koki frog is a prominent example here in Hawaii and the cane toad in Australia. Koki frogs are small tree frogs. They're native to Puerto Rico and they uh, are completely terrestrial. They don't have a tadpole stage. They probably came to Hawaii in potted plants with the nursery trade. They found a situation where they don't have their usual set of predators and there's plenty of food and good habitat. And so now we see them spreading and achieving uh, huge population densities here, three times the densities that you have in, uh, in their native habitat in Puerto Rico. And they're spreading so fast and so readily that they are, uh, are viewed as an invasive species. And most of the problems they cause for people in Hawaii is due to their chorusing. They have a very loud call, the, uh, the <whistles> coquille call. And when you have a large population of them all clustered together, they can produce a chorus that can be up to 74 decibels in, uh, in loudness. Here's a map of the big island of Hawaii showing the distribution of Koki frog populations. These are uh, revealed by people who have called in reporting infestations that they've been hearing. And what you see is a concentration of them over here on the eastern part of the island where the wet tropical forests are. That's the, where the best habitat is. And then also what you see is a pattern of the, of the frogs being dispersed along roads along the corridors of human traffic, people end up transporting them to found new populations. They get transported in uh, yard waste that people are moving around, or sometimes the frogs are just hitching a ride on cars. This is a male coquille frog. This is the one that gives the uh, very loud cry. And you can tell the males from the females because the males have a vocal sac that you can get a hold of and, and pull back as a, as a fold of skin here underneath the jaw females it's it's pretty much flat and the females although they do have a call it's very soft the koki frogs uh, hide during the day in the leaf litter and underneath uh, the, in the lava cracks here and they come out at night and climb up onto the trees and the males start calling to attract females and that's when we come out at night uh, to study them we go out into the uh, different forest types and we do what's called a mark and recapture study where we capture as many frogs as we can and tag them and then release them and then the next night we come back and look for those same frogs. So when we first catch a frog we take their um, snout vent length, the measurement in millimeters from the end of the frog to the tip of the nose and then we take a mass using this spring scale. By repeatedly capturing these uh, frogs at night we're able to mathematically estimate how many frogs are in the forest at night. Daylight's fading. It's time to switch to the infrared camera. Now my particular research with my students here concerns the frog populations. What we'll do is go to plots that we've established in the forest and on those plots catch all the frogs we can and mark them for recapture. And by coming back on successive nights and looking at the marked frogs and the new frogs, we can uh, make estimates of how many frogs live on the plot and thus how, what the population density of frogs is in this particular part of the forest. Here we're in a moderately loud chorus. I've got to raise my voice a little bit to be heard. I'm getting readings of about uh, decibel levels in the mid-60s. My student uh, Mia Warrington and I are, are working with measuring sound pressure levels. The more frogs there are, the more frogs will be calling. So when I'm measuring sound intensity on the meter, 
If there are more frogs calling in the chorus, I will get a higher decibel reading. We're looking to see if we can uh, use this overnight signal to get information about the numbers of frogs that are out there calling and what the environmental effects are on the reproductive activity. One of the uh, problems that we see potentially coming in the future is that the invasion of the frogs sets the stage for invasion of other things that will eat the frogs. For example, the brown tree snake, which is a, a nasty invasive species that has caused huge problems on Guam. Were that to happen and the brown tree snakes were to take advantage of, of large populations of frogs to fuel their own population explosion, it represents a huge threat to our native bird populations. That's why there is a large effort to fight the coquille frog and um, remove it from large areas.